So this is the second teacher translation camp, and that is really the first one on site. And we are very, very excited to um, be able to welcome you to Hildesheim, uh, especially our project partners. And of course, uh, Professor Lee Wei, who's here from University College London. Uh, unfortunately, not in presence, but also in a virtual way. On, on the other hand, uh, I don't know how you um, do it with, I've read that you have published some 160 articles already. so. <laughs> this is quite an amazing feat, and I think the only way to do that is to concentrate on, on writing sometimes. So let me first introduce uh, Professor Wei to you in a very short way before giving over the words um, to him and uh, handing over the floor. Um, Professor Wei is um, um, Chinese born, uh, he studied a, uh, a BA in English language in um, Beijing and then relocated to Newcastle University, first of all, as a teacher of Chinese, but then also got his um, master uh, um, there and his PhD uh, at the same university, Newcastle. And uh, in 1998, he became the first person with Chinese nationality to reach the position of full professor, uh, that is professor of applied linguistics in a UK university. Um, from then on, from Newcastle, he moved first to Birkbeck College in London and later on to the University College London, also as a chair uh, of applied linguistics. And since last year, he also serves as the director and dean of the Institute of Education. And he has also um, founded several scientific journals, published several handbooks and textbooks, and is a member of several prestigious academies. Um, flipping through, through this immense list of publication, it is very obvious that bilingualism is the one topic that really unites quite a lot of his research. Uh, beginning already with the um, PhD thesis and then also very uh, a large number of um, outstanding publications that um, I can't cite all over here, but I would like to cite one. Um, because last year we were able to uh, welcome Ophelia Garcia here at this teacher um, translation uh, teacher translanguaging camp as a keynote speaker, and uh, um, Professor Wei and Ophelia Garcia published in 2014 a very influential volume on translanguaging. Uh, so I think this connection is quite uh, quite wonderful that first the one author and then the second one are the our keynote speakers. Um, translanguaging, uh, in a sense, is a different way of conceptualizing um, people who have more than one linguistic resource at their disposal. Um, and uh, I think the concept in itself uh, um, is also very important because it um, yeah, asks us or questions us whether it is really necessary to prioritize uh, one linguistic uh, resource one language over another in this um, linguistic repertoire of people. And um, of course, uh, the one thing that also is very, very uh, dominant in Professor Wei's research is um, the multitude of languages that are um, coming to play here. Flipping through this list of publications, I find, for example, Cantonese, of course, other Chinese languages, English, Japanese, Russian, Turkish, Polish, Irish, quite a few languages uh, of migration. And um, I think the one thing that really uh, comes into mind here is that translanguaging seen from this as a different concept is of course also something that is very uh, interesting as a decolonizing project. I think that is also the title of one of your very recent publications and I'm very keen to see if uh, we can hear more about this in this talk. Uh, yeah, what more to say? I don't think there's any more to say, <laughs> Professor Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much for that generous introduction. And thank you for the kind invitation to this camp. I'm, I'm really delighted to be here with you. I know, I'm, you know you are, you're there in person. And I'm not, but uh, nevertheless, I, I, I think this is a great opportunity to uh, have uh, 
to exchange some ideas with you about uh, translanguaging. I'm glad, uh, I, well, I knew that uh, Ophelia spoke to uh, uh, this forum uh, before, uh, and I'm sure you will have heard, uh, you know, from her and others, uh, lots of things about translanguaging. Uh, I'm going to um, give you uh, my take on it, as it were, uh, and uh, I will try to speak um, uh, for about 15 minutes max, and then we, we, we should have uh, plenty of time for discussion. And I want to hear your uh, uh, views, your comments, and of course also clarifying any questions. So let me just share uh, the uh, PowerPoint uh, uh, first. Okay, so it's, it's sharing, yeah? Okay, thank you uh, again for uh, uh, having me here. I'm going to uh, start by, well, uh, what the, the talk is about translanguaging and translanguaging language and education. Uh, I, I suppose um, I, I'm sure you all realize that this is um, um, the, the term translanguaging is part of this uh, broader discussion with a trans preface. There are lots of uh, terms and concepts floating around transnational, uh, uh, transcultural, trans transdisciplinary, transgender, uh, uh, you know, from different uh, contexts and different uh, backgrounds. And translanguage, I guess, is uh, often viewed as one of these uh, uh, things that become uh, rather trendy uh, in the last uh, a few years. And people really want to ask the question, what is translanguaging? Now, sometimes I say this is not quite the right question uh, because uh, from, uh, from the moment, and I'm going to uh, uh, look at the history, the origin uh, in a minute, in some detail, uh, from the moment the, 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 the concept was invented, as it were, coined, the term was coined, uh, it was not meant to be uh, a descriptive label. It's not a thing in itself. It's not uh, an object to discover and describe. You can't say this is translanguaging and that is not, or this is translanguaging, that is something else. It's not about that. Uh, so translanguaging is really aimed at transforming the way uh, we think and talk about language, first of all, and also the way we think and talk about education, especially language education, but you know, education in, in the broad sense uh, as well. So uh, today I'm going to really talk, go, well, go through the origins and development of the concept of translanguaging. And I'll be focusing on translanguaging and language learning or language education. And I'm, in fact, I'm going to spend a bit more time on uh, um, two uh, specific concepts that I think are important and re uh, related to translanguaging. And uh, they are co-learning and the so-called pedagogy of vulnerability. I'm going to talk about them uh, in some detail. And I'll end with some practical challenges in implementing translanguaging as a philosophy to education, to learning, and as a pedagogical practice uh, as well. So uh, looking at the history and, and the origin of the concept of translanguaging, the broadly two uh, uh, roots uh, to uh, translanguaging. One is the uh, pedagogical approach to bilingual education. Uh, but specifically to uh, the education of bilingual learners. So it's not language education per se, but it's more to do with the education of bilingual learners, learners who are already bilingual. And many of you already know uh, um, that it was really first invented by, the term was first invented by Ken Williams. Um, um, a very experienced teacher trainer uh, and teacher educator uh, in uh, well in Wales, uh, who was uh, really looking at uh, the Welsh revitalization uh, uh, context uh, and looking at this pedagogical practice where one receives information through the medium of one uh, uh, language and gives uh, the information 
through the median of uh, a different language. In, in uh, the Welsh re revitalization context, the policy was to uh, um, uh, teach in Welsh, content teaching, not, not language teaching. Uh, but of course, there is no monolingual Welsh speaker. Uh, uh, the, uh, lots of the uh, bilingual Welsh English uh, um, learners uh, are more uh, uh, confident in, in English, which is the language of common uh, uh, communication amongst them, and they naturally respond to, to the teacher in the classroom in, in English. Uh, and it, it, but it, it can be it can be practiced by both the uh, teacher and the uh, student. Now, rather than seeing uh, this practice as against the school policy, which was clearly against the school policy, or uh, as a barrier to learning, Williams really emphasized this actually can help to maximize the learner's bilingual potential in learning, their bilingual uh, ability, because you have to really respect the fact they are bilingual, they're not monolingual. You know, if you adopt a monolingual approach, essentially you want them to suppress or control, uh, uh, innovate one of their languages. And that is not a good thing to uh, encourage uh, uh, them to learn anything. Uh, uh, so, you know, you want to maximize uh, their bilingual uh, ability in learning. And it was his uh, um, uh, English uh, supervisor, Colin Williams, uh, who introduced the, the, the idea to the wider English speaking world through the uh, um, textbook foundations of bilingual education and bilingualism in the second edition of that textbook. So uh, Williams regarded it as an effective pedagogical practice where the school language uh, or the language of instruction is different from the uh, languages of the learners. Uh, but as I say, this is not about a particular uh, um, linguistic structural phenomena. This is a, a general approach to uh, education, to learning, that is aimed at breaking the ideological divides between the so-called uh, indigenous versus immigrant, my, majority versus minority, and target versus mother tongue languages. You really don't want to maintain these dichotomies or differences or divides, but you want what you want to do is to empower both the learner and the teacher transform the power relations and focus on the process of teaching and learning on meaning making, enhancing experience, developing identity through this dynamic, flexible uh, multilingual practices that really go beyond, that's the transcending bit of the, of the trans, beyond the boundaries of languages. But also important to, to uh, point out that it was really uh, uh, also from, from uh, the moment uh, the concept was conceived across uh, modalities as well. Listening, speaking, reading and writing could be done in different named uh, uh, languages. So uh, multimodality and uh, transmodality was very much part of uh, the translanguaging idea. So translanguaging is not conceived as an object or linguistic phenomena to describe or analyze, not a thing in itself, it's really important to emphasize that, but a process and a practice and a process. A practice that involves dynamic and functionally integrated use of different languages and language varieties through uh, uh, different modalities, as I mentioned. You know, from the, from the uh, language user's point of view, they're not thinking, okay, the next word I'm going to use is going to be German. And then the following word, I'm going to switch to another uh, uh, named language. They're using whatever that comes to their mind uh, uh, for meaning making. It is also a practice. It is also a process of knowledge construction that goes beyond, again, the transcending bit uh, of boundaries uh, between named uh, uh, languages. And that's very important to emphasize. And in this context, we should remind ourselves, lots of people want to, uh, as I say, this came out of a particular type of bilingual education, which is revitalization of minority languages. And there's also content language integrated kind of learning. Uh, it's more to do with content rather than language itself. They're not teaching Welsh uh, as such, but trying to use Welsh as a medium of instruction. 
Uh, but uh, when it comes to the learning of additional languages, people say, well, you know, uh, 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 wouldn't it be better if we just focus in on uh, the target language and maximize the inputs uh, in the target language. But we mustn't forget the purpose of learning additional language, whether it's first, uh, uh, second, uh, um, uh, or, or whatever label you want to uh, uh, give. So the learning of additional languages is to become bilingual and multilingual. Yeah, it's not going to become another uh, monolingual replacing the first language you already have or the native mother tongue or whatever you call it. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the uh, models of education, language education, why are bilinguals and multilinguals not used as the target model? But usually we use uh, the monolingual L1 speaker as the model. Uh, and this debate has been there for decades, for generations, in fact. In, in, in certainly in foreign language edu uh, education. And what do bilinguals and multilinguals typically do? Well, they mix, borrow, switch between, and really go beyond the boundaries of named languages. Yeah? How can you tell if somebody is bilingual uh, or not? Uh, because bilinguals can pass by as uh, if they are monolingual. So, uh, this role of the first language in second or foreign additional language learning has been there for a very long time. We, we, we tend to have in foreign language education models where we want the uh, speaker uh, uh, to forget one of uh, the languages, like, uh, you know, block one uh, uh, of their eyes or, or by their uh, um, one hand uh, at the back, but still hoping that they will perform normal uh, uh, tasks. Uh, so that is one of the uh, uh, original areas where translanguaging started. Now, the other route uh, of uh, translanguaging or to translanguaging is quite different. And this is actually where I came in because I wasn't originally doing uh, language teaching, learning and language education as such. And when I joined force with uh, um, Ophelia and, and others uh, who are from the uh, education background, you know, they taught me a great deal of, of uh, their kind of interests and, and uh, the concerns there. Uh, uh, my interest was very much on uh, the idea of language, which has been in uh, distributed cognition and uh, anthropological linguistics for, for uh, a very long time also. For example, Pete Becker, an anthropological linguist, <coughs> borrowed the term languaging from Tillin uh, uh, biologists and, and uh, uh, others, and really argued very strongly there is no such thing as language, only continual languaging, an activity that all of us as human beings engage in everyday uh, uh, life. Uh, and language shouldn't be uh, regarded as an accomplished fact. Uh, as a thing made or finished, uh, but as a process of being made. And this has actually been in uh, um, uh, linguistics uh, uh, as well for some time. Uh, in second language acquisition, for example, especially in the cultural, sociocultural theory of second language acquisition, uh, Miro Swain uh, uh, used the concept of languaging to talk about the cognitive process um, of negotiating and producing meaningful, comprehensive output as part of language learning. So this, you know, she was linking uh, um, uh, cognition to uh, uh, languaging. So this was very much a means to mediate uh, um, cognition, she talked about uh, shaping knowledge and experience through language, uh, meaning making, again, you know, comes uh, uh, out of uh, her uh, uh, discussion, but also the ability to uh, uh, use language as a vehicle uh, 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 to articulate thoughts um, and uh, um, linking language in thinking, cognizing and consciousness uh, uh, together. She talked a lot about meta-languaging, uh, meta-discourse and all that. Now, uh, uh, it, the, my initial interest in, in uh, the translanguaging idea, as I say, you know, came out of languaging, 
because I wanted to really understand how is the thinking process affected by simultaneous use of multiple languages. You know, people kind of assume you have to mediate one thought in a named language. So what, what about bilinguals and multilinguals, especially what, what happens to their thinking process when they engaged in uh, uh, translanguage practices where they mix the elements from different languages and they switch between different languages. Uh, as well, you know, how do they then manage to think? What's the thinking process? We, or, or, or put it simply, although wrongly, which which language are they thinking in when they are engaged in that that kind of dynamic uh, modeling practices? And I also am um, uh, kind of interested in uh, um, studying um, language users and language learners that are uh, quite different from the kind of typical advanced second language learners from the classroom want to capture their talking it through in multiple languages, however incomplete or truncated their uh, knowledge of individual languages uh, 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 may be, is that entirety of ling uh, the learner's linguistic repertoire rather than knowledge of specific structures of, uh, of language uh, that uh, I'm interested in, or this so-called multi-competence uh, uh, that you know, uh, myself and Vivian Cook uh, um, uh, worked on. Uh, I should uh, just point out that the uh, idea of language, of course, has been there, uh, as I mentioned, for, for uh, a long time, especially in uh, the so-called uh, um, uh, ecological uh, psychology, which is really about uh, distributed cognition. And you see uh, the mention of the concept in these two leading journals. Language sciences is very much the leading journal in that kind of thinking. Uh, and uh, Paul Thiebaud, for example, um, uh, define languaging as uh, the assemblage of diverse material, biological, semiotic, cognitive properties, and capacities, which languaging agents, that's us, language users, orchestrate. This is a very, very important metaphor, orchestrate in real time and across different uh, or, or diversity of time scales, because it's about the coordination, it's about orchestration. It's, it's like, you know, a piece of music is a make uh, is, is a piece of meaning. Making music orchestration is meaning making. Now, when we listen to a piece of music, we don't listen to one instrument at a time. It doesn't make any sense. And the music is made of uh, contributions of different instruments at different uh, uh, amounts and different speed and different levels and pitch. Uh, and distributed uh, uh, language uh, scholars very much follow that kind of uh, uh, metaphor. And they are against the code view of language. Language is much more than abstract uh, 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 structures. And they regard language as a second order construct uh, of the first, uh, uh, a product of the first order activity, which is language and that everybody is engaged uh, in. And human language activity is radically heterogeneous and involves the interaction of processes on many different timescales, including neural, bodily, situated, uh, um, societal, uh, social, and cultural processes and events. And it is the coordination and collaboration and orchestration of these different processes that is uh, uh, what we should be focusing on. And that is at the essence of bilingual, multilingual, multi-competence. And look at the uh, uh, research design that either in psycholinguistics or in other uh, kind of research paradigms. What we typically do, we get the um, uh, bilinguals and multilinguals to separate uh, their languages, to dis differentiate and discriminate uh, uh, their uh, languages. We don't test their uh, true ability or their key uh, capacity of coordinating and integrating elements from different languages. We just don't test what they're actually really good at, which is multi-competence. Uh, so uh, just to come back to that, uh, uh, the languaging scholars really want us to rethink uh, of language, not as an organism-centered entity, not as, you know, 
just a brain product uh, with corresponding formalism uh, in terms of uh, uh, linguistic structures, but as a multi-scalar organization processes that enables the bodily, the situated to interact with situation. Again, transcending, these are not our words, these are uh, you know, other uh, scholars' words, uh, uh, but you know, we echoed uh, these uh, transcending cultural historical dynamics and practices. And these scholars don't see the divides between uh, um, the, the so-called linguistic, paralinguistic, and extralinguistic dimensions of human communication uh, as meaningful at all. In fact, they think it's total nonsense to try to do, uh, 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 separate them. For example, uh, when I'm speaking here, even though uh, I'm not doing this in person, I'm, I still have the facial expression. I still uh, have the body uh, uh, posture. I still use my uh, hand gesture with, without which it will be a different meaning. It will be a completely different meaning. You know, the words can be the same, but it will be a different meaning. I apologize for the noise. Uh, my office is, uh, is above a postal depot. So there are lots of trucks going on there. Uh, the orchestration of the neural bodily and worldly skills of languaging is really, really the key here is that orchestration metaphor. And the importance of feeling, experience, history, memory, subjectivity, and culture, and even ideology and power also important. And, you know, they don't let anything uh, go. They're all part of the meaning making process. And, you know, it's really to try to move away from a narrow focus on linguistic bit. Now, uh, uh, the language and translanguaging uh, uh, um, scholarship also has a particular take on language learning. And that is the novice does not acquire language. It's not like it's a passive kind of uh, um, uh, uh, process, although required uh, uh, acquisition doesn't have to be passive, of course. But rather they adapt their bodies and brains to the languaging activity that is surrounding them. So this is very much a language socialization uh, kind of approach, but with a bit of cognition and biology uh, um, uh, uh, in it as well. And in doing that, in adapting their bodies and adapting their brains, uh, they participate in cultural worlds and learn how they can get things done uh, with others or according to the social cultural norms with linguistic resources and other semiotic resources. Uh, uh, and, and clearly they are influenced by the culturally promoted norms and values of, of the community. And that's very important. So again, if you want a definition of translanguaging, then uh, translanguaging is a dynamic process whereby language users draw on different linguistic, cognitive, semiotic, and modal resources to make meaning and also to make sense out of the same process, but depending on uh, uh, the perspective, transcending the boundaries between named languages, but also transcending uh, the boundaries between language and other meaning and sense-making resources. And in this day and age, digital uh, communication, it, you know, uh, the use of uh, color, font size, spatial repertoire, uh, 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 emoji, just as important, if not more important, than the linguistic signs and, and, and symbols. This goes back to uh, some of the earlier work uh, by Halliday and others uh, calling uh, um, uh, language as a social semiotic. Now, clearly, this kind of uh, uh, approach to language uh, uh, is going to uh, transform, or it's a very different approach uh, to uh, uh, a language or the conceptualization of language. So we transform, aim to transform the way we conceptualize and talk about language. Boundaries between named languages are social, cultural, historical realities. Yeah, that's what translanguaging uh, uh, scholars always emphasize. So the boundaries between, say, uh, uh, Scandinavian languages, uh, um, uh, Dutch, uh, Swedish, uh, and Norwegian, is very much a historical, sociopolitical, and ideological kind of uh, uh, decision, uh, um, uh, rather than a linguistic 
kind of uh, uh, facts. And uh, the, uh, the, 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 the facts are mutually unintelligible uh, uh, languages can be uh, uh, grouped together as varieties or dialects of one language, like the, the so-called uh, uh, dialects of Chinese. Again, is a, is a political uh, decision in a way. Now, uh, we, should, we, we should really take that argument very seriously. So if we say these na the naming of languages is a political decision and named languages are socio-political entities, they are socio-political realities, then uh, uh, we, we can ask interesting questions. How then can they be represented uh, 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 by the bilingual mind or bilingual brain? Now that would be quite interesting, uh, although you know at the moment people don't ask questions from that particular perspective. They just assume that the the, the political process of naming uh, uh, languages uh, actually reflects psychological reality. When well, the psychological reality is quite different, the human brain area responsible for language is the same for all named languages. Yeah, it's not like you know French sits here, German sits in another place, or Arabic sits uh, 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 in yet another uh, different part of the brain. And also the brain area uh, responsible for uh, language is also responsible for other cognitive functions like memory, attention, and emotion. You can't have a, a language without memory. You can't have language without attention. And uh, one of the reasons why there is a whole surge of interest in emotion in uh, uh, language learning and language acquisition in the last 20 years or so is people suddenly <laughs> kind of realize, oh, is the same brain area that is responsible for emotion and effect uh, processing that is also pro uh, responsible for uh, processing linguistic information. So these are all the same area. And uh, the cognitive representation, uh, the so-called cognitive representation and, uh, and language awareness are very much outcomes of social socialization experience. You know, we, you know, children, bilingual children are brought up uh, uh, realizing, okay, you know, mother speaks French, uh, father speaks German, uh, uh, but that's, a, that, that, that's part of the socialization. And okay, there may, may well be features uh, uh, that are cognitively represented um, uh, differently, uh, but these are fundamentally social outcomes. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, these are uh, uh, kind of uh, caricatures, uh, the, the human brain is not divided like that, uh, sensation is here, speech is there, vision is there, it's, not, it's the same part of the brain that really is responsible for, for all of these, and so that's why the, the multi-competence idea is, is definitely uh, worth looking at, and these are even more kind of uh, 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 <laughs> stereotypical kind of assumptions people might, may make, and they're definitely not how the, uh, the human brain uh, 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 works. Um, uh, and uh, the human being, well, human beings are socialized into community, society, uh, uh, nation-specific ways of using a set of linguistic structures and features, which linguists give names as language. But this is really, I mean, you know, taking this argument right way through is really, really hard and really important. Uh, um, uh, I mean, just like uh, we think English uh, is this is this one language, but if you look at it, uh, you know the way uh, uh, um, American uh, English speakers use the linguistic structure, linguistic resources, elements, structural elements, is very different from the way, say, South African English speakers or Australian English speakers or Indian English speakers or Singaporean English speakers. All of them can claim some sort of nativeness to the, uh, to the, to the English language, but actually it's all, it all depends on community, society, nation-specific ways of using a set of uh, linguistic structural features, and that's uh, uh, the uh, uh, socialization process. But in meaning and sense making, they do not think about the name first. You know, you're not thinking, again, you, uh, you know, next word, I'm going to switch to this language uh, just for the sake of it, and then I'm going to switch back in uh, uh, another language. In fact, when we record people engaged in, uh, in translanguaging practices and play it back, 
people generally do not uh, uh, um, uh, realize actually they did the switch or they think, oh yeah, oh that bit. And sometimes they come up with expressions and they, they can't quite pin down. Uh, you know, I think in the European context, we're, we're a bit more used to naming languages and separating languages, but in the Pacific Islands and in African uh, uh, communities and in Latin America, it's, it's so multilingual and it's very dynamic. And there are always expressions that even the speakers themselves don't know. You can't, you, you know, it's no good for linguists, especially Western linguists to come in and say, which language is that? And they just say, we don't know, but this is how we speak, how we use the language. And you know, you are the linguist, you tell me which language uh, that is, but that, that's not our concern, <laughs> that's not. So they engage in meaning making rather than naming the language. And uh, they switch between and mix them dynamically for meaning and sense making beyond simple encoding and, and, and decoding. Uh, uh, again, we really want to emphasize this because there is a bit of confusion. Translanguage does not deny the existence of named languages, uh, but we stress that uh, languages are historical, political, and ideologically uh, uh, defined entities. Uh, research on language evolution and in historical linguistics show that all human languages evolved from fairly simple combination of sounds, gesture, icons, uh, uh, symbols, etc. There's lots of documentation there and lots of uh, really interesting uh, studies and theories. And there's also ample evidence uh, from neuroscience that the differently named languages are not represented or controlled by different parts of the brain, as I already said, and efforts to identify the location of this so-called language switch uh, uh, has not been uh, uh, proven to be uh, successful at all. You know, there's no such thing. So if, if, the, if, if we start with a non-code view, and you know, there's no such thing as a switch, then you know, some of the uh, old uh, concepts, of course, that uh, won't make sense, but I'm not going to go there uh, uh, today. A multilingual from a translanguaging perspective is someone who is aware of the existence of the political entities of named languages. The multilinguals are very good. We, we, we know the names and labels, and they have acquired some of the structural features of all of these but they have the ability to use them in combination in a coordinated and meaningful way. And that's what they're good at. Okay, I'm moving slightly on to the, uh, to the education bit. So translanguaging transforms our way of looking at thinking and talking about language, uh, but it also transforms the way we see uh, language education and language learning, but actually beyond language also, you know, uh, about learning and education alone. On language learning specifically, uh, as I mentioned earlier, <coughs> following the kind of traditional languaging uh, perspective, uh, translanguaging scholars uh, see lang uh, language learning as a process of socializing oneself into a different way of using certain linguistic structures and features. So it not only applies to different communities, societies, nations, and cultures, but also different ages, different uh, uh, generations, different genders, different social groups, different professions and, and, and workplace. For example, a very simple example, if we get a new job, or even if we move to a, 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 a different department, maybe using exactly the same named language, but we have to adapt to a different way of using that language because there may be a different norm of communication that we're not familiar with. And in that sense, language learning is a really uh, a lifelong experience. We have to adapt ourselves all the time to the culturally appropriate uh, uh, norms. And the political labeling of language in language education, in language learning, has serious uh, social consequences. If you keep uh, calling some, uh, classifying some languages native and others as foreign, or some as first, second, or additional, and we're still, if you, uh, if you classify some as national and others as community, or some as indigenous, others as Im uh, um, immigrant languages or minority languages, 
they, they have serious social consequences. It's not just the language, it's the speakers and the users of those languages. You, you, you are classifying some as native first, others as foreign, uh, uh, you know, as minority, as immigrant. These are serious social consequences and we have to be uh, 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 concerned. So in this regard, translanguaging is about equity and social justice and about inclusion, because we want to make sure that we want, you know, our practices and policies transcend the boundaries uh, uh, between named uh, languages uh, and the uh, social groups that we classify people into. Now, translanguaging the way we think and talk about education means uh, finding a, a different uh, a narrative, different, uh, and ask different sets of questions. So if education is about knowledge construction, does the language in which knowledge is constructed matter? So if we have an immigrant uh, um, uh, student or, or a student of immigrant background, they may well have acquired really valuable, important knowledge uh, uh, in another language prior to entering uh, to you know, Germany or whatever uh, the host, uh, country may be. Now, does the, that knowledge matter? And does the language in which that knowledge was acquired matter? Does the, co the cultural context in which the knowledge uh, system is, is constructed matter? And uh, what impact do our pedagogical practices and classroom interaction have on knowledge construction? Because each, even each classroom, the pedagogical practice is the way we engage uh, uh, the uh, learners in the classroom discourse, as it were, may well have an impact, serious impact on the way uh, knowledge is, is, a, uh, is constructed and, and, and acquired. This is, uh, uh, in some sense, uh, simply about the role of prior knowledge, but actually, you know, it's not, uh, it's more complex than, than, than that. Um, it is about inclusion, it is about uh, um, um, uh, equity and uh, 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 justice. Again, uh, the learners uh, of bilingual immigrant minority background have their funds of knowledge, again, concept uh, uh, promoted by um, uh, uh, education scholars, uh, especially in the United States, or even um, uh, uh, about language learning. This is about uh, kind of inclusive education. They have funds of knowledge in their uh, language. It's acquired in specific cultural contexts. And the knowledge they have already acquired elsewhere in specific contexts impacts on the way they acquire new knowledge in a different uh, uh, language. And that is really important for any educator. To have, we have to make positive use of that uh, existing knowledge. So we have to understand the, uh, 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 how that knowledge was acquired in what kind of cultural context. Uh, and transfer, and interestingly, in second language acquisition, there's so much uh, uh, discussion about transfer, but quite often it's, it's, it's kind of, you know, transfer from L1 to L2 is, is the source of error. It's kind of only negative. You know, we, we don't talk enough about positive uh, uh, transfer. And certainly, uh, there's a lot of evidence that transfer can be multidimensional uh, as well. You know, once you learn some elements of, uh, of an additional language, your, your, your uh, per, uh, um, uh, per, uh, perception and processing of your so-called mother tongue or, or first language will be quite different. So in this context, I want to introduce uh, something that uh, Edward Brandmeier has been talking about for some time, and that is co-learning and uh, um, pedagogy uh, of vulnerability. Uh, uh, both of, uh, of which are aimed at repositioning the teacher vis-a-vis -vis the learner in, in, in a new or transformed uh, uh, symbolic power relations. Co-learning emphasizes all languages, uh, sorry, all knowledge, in all languages is valued and must be valued. And reciprocal value of knowledge sharers, uh, and th those are the co-participants of a learning process. And they care for 
uh, uh, each other as people, as co learners So the teacher uh, uh, pupil uh, relationship with teacher a student uh, relationship is turned into a co uh, um, uh, learner uh, relationship. The teacher can learn just as much as the uh, from the learners from the students as uh, uh, students from the teacher. It's all about building trust and all about learning from each other. And uh, uh, the so-called vulnerability, uh, the uh, pedagogy of vulnerability is for the teacher to open oneself up and contextualizing that self in societal constructs and system. We are products of social cultural systems uh, uh, as well. Uh, and we need to uh, admit uh, we don't know everything. We are human and we're prepared to, uh, to, to co-learn with uh, uh, the students. It's about taking risks, and teachers do need to take risks. Risks of uh, self-disclosure, of change, of not knowing, and of failing. Uh, and we uh, then reposition ourselves as uh, co-learners and value the knowledge, values, and uh, insights of all involved, especially uh, the students. Unlearn cultural conditioning, and that's really, really important and dismantle the asymmetrical power relations. So in the classroom, we're all equal. That's very hard to achieve. That, 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 that really is very hard to achieve and it's not a conventional kind of way. And to link translanguage and co-learning together uh, means we need to value all languages and knowledge gained in all languages. We need to learn each other's languages it's a perspective on the world. We need to uh, create opportunities for different ways of uh, uh, um, uh, learning and talking about learning. So, you know, uh, we, we, when we deal with uh, immigrant and uh, minoritized uh, learners, we can, we can actually ask them, you know, how, how does this concept work in uh, uh, the languages you you know or you use at home and your or your community. You know, have you learned to solve a, a problem like this in another language in another context? And let's hear it. And you know, are there alternative ways of of uh, 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 doing things? It's really important to emphasize that translanguage is not additive. It's not just about. Uh, you know, uh, especially when we put uh, this into the co-learning and pedagogy of vulnerability context, it's not about allowing in the kind of patronizing way different languages of minoritized uh, uh, pupils to, to be used in the learning or in, in, in the classroom. Translanguaging is fundamentally reconstitutive, trying to challenge, transform, and reconstituting uh, uh, language status, you know, uh, language ideologies and uh, the authorities and power relations in learning. So I want to uh, uh, sum up and end with some practical uh, challenges. I know this, you know, it's all great to hear uh, uh, these things in, in, in abstract. Uh, people uh, do come up with, uh, with uh, very specific practical questions, especially as, as teachers. Uh, so students, uh, one of the frequent, uh, frequent asked questions is students have too many different native languages, much more than the teacher can possibly uh, understand or manage. Uh, uh, how do I manage uh, that, you know, linguistic diversity in the classroom? Well, education is not just about language alone. It's about knowledge construction as, uh, as the whole uh, you know, thesis here is about, uh, and particularly how language, how knowledge is constructed. The knowledge construction is about how knowledge is constructed. So again, you know, practical solutions. Ask yourself: Do the learners, linguistic di diverse learners, know the concept or a method or a fact or the reasoning, problem solving already in their L ones, whatever that may be? Uh, and if yes. Do they think what they know in a different language is different from what you are trying to teach, you know, as, as the textbook tells them or tells you and what the teacher may be uh, uh, telling the, uh, the pupils. You really understand how knowledge is constructed and finding alternatives to it. 
Another practical uh, question is I need to maximize, this, this is especially for language classes. I, I want to maximize the input of target language uh, uh, within a, a fixed unlimited period of time. So I can't possibly allow uh, every language to be, uh, to be spoken. It's not about uh, uh, letting um, uh, allowing every language to, 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 to be spoken. And we also have to say, uh, remind ourselves that real learning, especially of language, learning of language requires use in, in context. That's why it's different from learning other uh, 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 subjects where you, once you understand a concept or you get the information, then you, you should be able to remember it. Where language is not about remembering the, 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 the structures or the rules, it's about actually putting it into use and actually seeing it uh, in use. And classroom learning, for language at least, is by definition very limited and rather superficial. Uh, and we have to accept that. And monolingual approach to language learning has proven to be rather ineffective. And that's why, you know, been so many uh, decades of research on trying to improve the uh, effectiveness of, uh, of uh, uh, language uh, uh, learning pedagogies. The bilingual monolingual approach to language learning maximizes the learner's potential, especially learners of minority uh, uh, um, language uh, background as the translanguaging scholarship uh, ha has shown. And we also have to uh, remind ourselves of the long-term consequence of putting down uh, the learners L1s. You know, the learners L1s uh, in the foreign language uh, or additional language uh, uh, education programs clearly different. But if you always uh, say, you know, don't use it, you know, focus on the target language only, you may well develop a certain uh, social attitude towards the language and towards the users of those languages. And also have to bear in mind the potential uh, register loss. Uh, we have very good advanced second language learners who then can't actually say, uh, 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 write a scientific paper or give a, a, a speech in their first language because they've you know, really uh, moved so far into another language. Uh, one thing we don't know, and psycholinguists uh, uh, haven't quite uh, looked at it, is the, the long-term consequence of putting down the learners L1s uh, in terms of inhibition and uh, uh, suppression, how that impacts on the cognitive processing and also on the emotional processing. We actually haven't seen much research uh, uh, from that uh, particular uh, uh, perspective. Really to, uh, to uh, uh, summarize and uh, conclude now, the translanguaging aims to develop a holistic and equitable view of bi multilingualism, bilingualism and multilingualism. Uh, minority and minoritized languages matter. In fact, all languages matter. Uh, it emphasizes uh, the multilingual uh, capacity or the so-called linguistic multi-competence as Vivian Cook uh, uh, talked about, uh, going beyond the language dimension to factor sensory embodied and perceptual cognitive skills too into the equation. Well, I haven't really talked about those aspects today, but they can easily uh, go into uh, the discussion and actually really, really important. Translanguaging really fosters or aims to foster creativity uh, uh, through novel ways of combining, mixing language, uh, linguistic structures and creating new expressions. This is in, to be encouraged, uh, to be promoted, and also uh, criticality, different ways of thinking and doing, different traditions, different learning, different pedagogies, different practices, different values and different ideologies. And creativity and criticality are key to education. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Wei. Um, stop <laughs> sharing. Yeah, thanks. This was a wonderful, fully packed and enlightening presentation. And Thank you so much. <laughs> you, I see some hands clapping on the screen. Um, so now there's some time for your questions. So yes. if anyone has questions or topics or um, 
yeah, comments on what was just presented, please come forward and, and ask them. You can just switch on the, to uh, on the yeah. sound. <laughs> Okay, so maybe I will start. Oh, with yes, thank you. Give you all some time to warm up some ideas. Well, I was uh, um, still in your last slides. Thank you very much for this very inspiring talk. And I tried to figure out how your lectures are. Are your lectures in translanguaging? How, how, do, you, how do you practice translanguaging with your students? I would yeah, uh, that's a really good question. Uh, um, uh, my my uh, uh, lectures, I absolutely do encourage uh, uh, students to uh, practice translanguaging uh, um, in, in, in groups, not necessarily to me as such. Uh, and they, because we do have uh, very diverse, uh, linguistically diverse uh, uh, students. So they can, uh, they can discuss in whatever language they feel most comfortable with in, in, in their groups. And then we have the sharing of that. But my, I guess my focus is very much on uh, knowledge sharing, this co-learning. Uh, you know, how, how does a thing, a concept or a problem uh, uh, works in your culture or your language or another context? And let's hear uh, uh, the process, and let's hear the solution, and let's share that. And uh, you know, the ultimate goal is for all the uh, participants in the, in the session to uh, uh, to realize there are alternatives. Nothing is there is only one solution, and that is uh, 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 the the essence of all. Uh, our teaching is not just myself. Um, we very much kind of really believe in that kind of philosophy. So, uh, you know, because we engage, we, we engage in lots of teacher training. And it's actually really important for teachers to remember there isn't one single answer uh, uh, to the problems uh, uh, that uh, they have to teach the students to, uh, uh, to solve. Uh, there's no one solution. And their task is not to give the one uh, solution, to give a one standard correct uh, answer or solution to the pupils. They need to really get uh, the pupils to start thinking and problem solving and realize the alternatives. Yeah. And, uh, and help them to learn how to make choice and how to make decision, which is a much harder task. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, comments, questions? And maybe I, I, I can I add noch mal kurz auf Deutsch sagen, liebe Studierende, wenn ihr euch jetzt vielleicht nicht traut, weil ihr sagt, mein Englisch ist vielleicht nicht gut genug, ihr könnt auch Translanguaging machen. Ihr dürft <lacht> schreiben, yes. was ihr wollt, und wir werden es dann natürlich auch so gut wie es geht übersetzen. So I just encourage the students, if they want, yes. they also ask in every language they feel comfortable. Thank you, Elke. I think Professor Kirsten, Kirsten wanted to say something, right? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. That is a really fascinating topic, and I very much enjoy listening to your talk. Um, when I think and read about translanguaging, I'm... Um, uh, often wondering about the um, empirical basis, and I was wondering whether you have, um, whether you're aware of some uh, studies that look into the effectiveness of translanguaging, like the impact on language learning, but maybe also on self-concept or identity, attitudes, cognitions, or also just about a comparison of different practical implementations, which I find is extremely difficult since they're, um, it's a general approach, but there might be very, very different ways of implementing it yes. uh, in yeah. the practice. Yeah, uh, that, that's an excellent question. It, it, it does get asked quite, quite a lot. Uh, um, I guess, uh, well, there are a number of ways of, of answering it, and you already uh, indicated that the, the context can be very, very different and diverse. So it's, it's you know, uh, depending on how you want to measure it. So something that is 
uh, that seems to be effective uh, in one class may not be very effective in another, even depending on the, uh, the, 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 the subject matter. Uh, so, you know, in, in the Welsh revitalization uh, uh, programs, uh, you know, it's, it's not kind of practice in every uh, uh, single class, depending on the content uh, and, and the subject uh, uh, matter. Uh, the other uh, uh, thing uh, about this, uh, that, that is really hard to measure if we want to uh, uh, focus on uh, so, sort of effectiveness, is, is the learner's background, their contribution, and the way the instructor facilitates and man manages uh, uh, the learning. So I think those makes it uh, uh, very uh, uh, difficult uh, to measure, uh, but that doesn't mean that we, we shouldn't be raising those questions. I think the effectiveness of any pedagogy uh, is, uh, is quite a legitimate question. I guess the, the, the way I want to uh, respond to that is there is no, there is no efficacy study uh, in fact, uh, any, any, uh, uh, everything I can see uh, points to uh, the ineffectiveness of the monolingual approach to language teaching. Yeah, we, we've been doing that for decades, generations. And, uh, you know, why are we spending literally billions uh, uh, of hours, uh, and, you know, money and, 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 and energy uh, uh, to, to teach foreign languages? Uh, because the monolingual approach hasn't actually proven to be very uh, uh, effective. What we know for sure, uh, and, and that's what learners tell us, uh, especially by, uh, um, bilingual uh, and minoritized learners, is the translanguaging pedagogy gives them a, a lot more confidence and they feel much more comfortable to be involved in the process of learning. Uh, and you know, it, it, it can, those things can't be measured by uh, test results or by, by you know, their the, the kind of specific knowledge of linguistic structures. Uh, there are uh, uh, people who are uh, very much involved in developing uh, dynamic assessment systems for translanguaging, both uh, um, uh, aiming to, to, uh, to assess uh, their um, strengthening or, or improvement of their multi-competence. So you can't, you can't test them one language at a time. You have to test them all in the truly uh, uh, translanguaging way as well. Uh, so uh, for example, in, in Israel, the people are really, really act, act, actively doing projects, uh, uh, developing new ways of, uh, of uh, assess, assessing people's uh, um, uh, translanguaging uh, um, uh, practices or, or their competence. Uh, but uh, in terms of uh, using it as a pedagogy for foreign language le uh, teaching and learning, it's actually only beginning to be used. People uh, kind of, you know, only beginning to be used. I'm sure things will change and there will be ways of, of looking at the effectiveness of that. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. There's a question in the chat um, from yeah. Letizia. And after the qu uh, Letizia's question, Maria, um, tu puedes uh, preguntar. Okay, so um, the question is, what do you think, what do we need to encourage more teachers to allow <laughs> translanguaging? Teachers often think that they lose control if they allow translanguaging. Yeah. Mm -hmm. th th this is exactly why uh, Edward uh, Brandmeier talked about uh, um, uh, the risks uh, in, in the so-called pedagogy of vulnerability. And uh, he deliberately chose the uh, 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 word uh, vulnerability, but actually it's about building uh, self-confidence. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, uh, it, it, taking risks of self-disclosure, unlearning, not knowing, failing, and losing control. Well, the classroom shouldn't be controlled by any individual. Uh, you know, have to look at that power relation set. Uh, and the, the whole thing about co-learning, co-learning is, is a concept that came out of uh, a computation, uh, well, uh, uh, computer science really, it's about different agents and uh, uh, um, adapting to each other. And then the pattern will emerge from that. Nobody is dominating. 
And actually, the whole thing is, you know, try to avoid any one single agent dominating the scene. Uh, but we don't typically see the classroom. We don't see education in that way. Uh, education, especially the classroom, is typically asymmetrical. And the whole idea of translanguaging, uh, uh, co-learning, uh, pedagogy of vulnerability is to go against that, to challenge that uh, um, mindset and challenge that asymmetrical power relations and actually to build uh, a creativity and, uh, and criticality in the learners. So the learners can ask questions, can challenge the teacher and can actually challenge the authority. The teacher isn't necessarily there as the authority uh, uh, themselves, they are a representation, they are a representative of an authority through uh, uh, their control of the uh, of the information or textbooks or, or the syllabus. So, you know, again, we have to rethink what is our role in the learning process and what is our role in the in, in the classroom where they are to act on behalf of somebody else, actually not ourselves. Thank you. So there was another question from Letizia. I would like to ask that question and then Marie, you can ask your question. She asked, um, it, um, could you think of any reason, good reason to not apply translanguaging in classrooms or any educational settings? Because she says now after all these um, great um, talks, so she has no there, there comes no reason to her mind not using or not translating. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that, that, that's a really great question. I mean, you know, I, I uh, um, uh, have given talks about the idea of uh, um, uh, translanguaging, and it's, it is still very much an idea for lots of people to, to develop and, and uh, uh, extend uh, and, and try to apply in different contexts. And I end up uh, uh, the, those talks uh, um, with uh, a book called, uh, well, Steven Pinker endorsed, you know, uh, what's your dangerous idea? You know, some ideas are quite dangerous. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, translanguaging could, could well be a dangerous idea because, you know, it kind of uh, encourages people to think really in an unconventional kind of way. Now, I wouldn't say, uh, um, you know, a, a context where translanguaging may be a, a really dangerous or bad uh, idea, uh, but in some context, it may, it may not work uh, to the um, uh, effects or benefits or the, or, or the objectives that one sets one's, uh, um, oneself uh, to achieve. For example, in um, in 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 uh, the so-called endangered language uh, protection uh, preservation uh, uh, field, there are people who are very worried about uh, a flexible uh, multilingual approaches to it, uh, because people are devoting their entire career in in documenting and supporting. Uh, 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 these so-called endangered uh, uh, languages. Uh, and they want to write grammar books, uh, compile dictionaries for these uh, um, uh, endangered languages. Now, again, that itself is already a controversial uh, uh, field because uh, uh, that kind of effort, uh, uh, valuable as they are, are not always appreciated by the communities. Uh, especially in this uh, post-colonial uh, 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 era, as it were, uh, lots of communities kind of feel, okay, these are essentially white European linguists coming in uh, and kind of uh, sampling our uh, languages and then write a, a grammar or compiled dictionary that only uh, um, Europeans would ever uh, use because the people in the community uh, will never use them because uh, they're highly multilingual. They never speak one of the languages, whether it's endangered or not. It, it just doesn't work uh, uh, to them. So that's already a, a kind of uh, a controversial area. But in those uh, uh, circumstances, you know, what's the benefit? 
of, of uh, 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 the translanguaging approach. That's one area. I mean, there are some other areas that, uh, you know, in, in, in the cultural communication, there are still lots of people assume that the, 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 lang the name language is really, really, really matter. That is always a cultural barrier there. And, you know, certain kind of uh, um, uh, boundaries might be uh, useful, uh, uh, translation, interpreting areas. Again, you know, there are occasions where, you know, maintaining the boundaries and divisions uh, um, are needed. So, I mean, you know, there, there are lots of context uh, that perhaps you know, translanguage was never aimed to, to serve all purposes anyway. It's specifically to do with the education of minoritized uh, bilingual and multilingual uh, learners. You know, mm -hmm. uh, learners who are already bilingual and multilingual, whether we, we want to suppress their uh, other languages and, uh, and uh, force them to use one language only, usually the, uh, the, the school language or the university language, uh, uh, or uh, 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 really encourage them to use their uh, bilingual multilingual resources in learning. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I think the next question is coming from Maria. Maria, uh, And after that, we have a question in the chat okay. and then Marjan. Sure. Okay. Thank you very much uh, for this enlightening talk. Uh, I'm very, I'm very happy. I'm very, I feel honored to, to listen to you uh, personally. Thank you very much. Well, I have a, a comment I, and, and a question. Well, I, as a teacher educator of future language teachers, I have found, as many of us, a, that a, we, ha we have to cope with this isomorphism uh, phenomenon in terms of uh, working with the uh, future teachers who have been acquiring the language through uh, these suppressive, limitative uh, way of teaching it, 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 in terms of this monolingual type of approach, let's say. So uh, one way uh, that we have been approaching to that uh, is towards reflective teaching practice mm. in terms of what uh, Thomas Farrell states uh, that uh, we have to examine our principles, our philosophy, what we believe language is and, and, and so on uh, in order to uh, start encouraging this uh, translanguaging pedagogy. Um, what do you think of of this? Uh, could it be uh, the well, absolutely un possible I, I, way? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no. I, I mean, that's a great comment. Uh, uh, I mean, you know, I think uh, uh, reflecting on uh, uh, language. I mean, you know, if if there's one thing that the so called modern linguistic science has has been arguing for is, you know, structurally. Uh, uh, all human languages, named languages, are equal. Yeah, absolutely equal. You, you, the, 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 the social values we give to uh, languages is a very much a social, political, ideological uh, uh, um, uh, consequence of, 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 you know, of policy decisions. So, you know, uh, we can reflect on uh, the capacity of any linguistic system uh, to articulate uh, uh, the same thoughts and ideas, uh, but how come some uh, uh, languages become uh, uh, minority, minoritized? Yeah, and, and disadvantaged because uh, any minority language uh, in the world is a majority language for some people in some context. Yeah, any community language is uh, is also a, a could well be a national language in some other context. So you know th those are those are really important reflections. I think teachers uh, uh, could well do with their. Uh, uh, students and it's not uh, the the kind of typical narrowly focused 
uh, um, uh, language awareness discussion, but it, it could could well be. Uh, actually, we can we can start with uh, language awareness work uh, uh, about grammar, about uh, uh, pronunciation, about specific structures, but expand it and really reflect on the social cultural context and the social cultural consequences of those uh, 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 broader uh, issues that are happening and that impacting on the uh, 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 structures. I think that uh, is something that uh, language teachers really in their training should be reflecting on. And we're very much doing that in our teacher training programs, actually. No. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Mr. Wei, do you still have time for two questions? Yeah, I can answer one, one more question. One more question. Yeah. Okay, um, then Swaye asks, I'm a student in the field of arts and literature. Do you have um, any examples or ideas of how to imply translanguaging in this area of creativity? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. Of course, uh, you know, if you look at literature, written literature, uh, and obviously also oral literature, uh, you know, there are lots of uh, translingual practices. I don't particularly work on that, uh, but there's, there's just plenty. I mean, novels from the from the old classics to 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 the uh, you know the latest contemporary uh, um, uh, creative writing. It, it, there are lots and lots, and increasingly more uh, um, uh, translanguaging or translingual writing. That's that's for sure. But uh, uh, another uh, area of uh, art humanities, if you want, where translanguaging and creativity are really closely linked, is the is the uh, digital mediated communication. And you just looking online. Uh, I mean, I, I actually can't see much uh, that is really in one language only, even the so-called uh, uh, monolingual. Uh, uh, if you just think of language, the the so-called monolingual digital communication has lots of uh, emoji, uh, you know, icons uh, and color fonts, the spatial arrangement. It's just so uh, um, uh, translanguaging, <laughs> you know, there's no better word uh, 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 for it. Uh, you know, the, 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 the transmodal kind of uh, practice is, is so visible. Uh, 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 there, I mean, you know, uh, obviously my work is influenced by uh, some of the work that my colleagues here are doing. You know, I'm in the IOE, uh, famous for multimodality uh, work and famous for uh, social semiotic work. You know, Halliday, when he was a professor here in the 70s, he already talked about well, the famous book, Language as a Social Semiotic. And he, his uh, 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 students like Winter Kress, uh, my, my late colleague, uh, you know, looked at uh, language as one of many different modal modalities and, and modal resources one can use for uh, uh, communication. And the digital uh, uh, platform really shows very vividly this kind of translingual and translanguaging practices that involves different modalities and different semiotic resources. And it's highly, highly, highly creative. Yeah, I was just thinking about the gaming scene, but there's one quick question, I think, sure. from Marjan, and then we can finish, okay? Sure. Great, thank you. Thank you so much for your interesting talk, and I've really enjoyed reading so many of your papers, and I think that like uh, teaching or using translanguaging in a class, we've seen actually in our research that it really does help, but wanting to take this one step further and actually thinking about how can we also maybe teach the process of translanguaging yeah. that emerges um, to me an important question because I've taught uh, many classes in German as a foreign language to refugees and myself coming from a family of refugees from Iran, yeah. I have to look back to a long history of no translanguaging and no translanguaging existing at all. And I know maybe that this is a case in many families from Iran. And I see that yeah. actually from, from students now coming from different uh, refugee contexts. And I was wondering whether there's actually some research about the process or the, the possibility of teaching a process of translanguaging where it yeah. doesn't come naturally. Yeah, no, I think that's a great uh, uh, question. And that is a great suggestion. I don't, I'm not aware of any, any, anything that, that is there to really to teach uh, uh, people how to 
uh, do it. I guess it's also because uh, you know everybody would translate language in a slightly different way depending on their uh, trajectory, their history, and their attitude. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, yes, absolutely. I mean, you know, it, 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 again, to remind ourselves uh, the purpose of learning any uh, language is to become bilingual and multilingual. And a real bilingual and multilingual would absolutely switch between languages and move around between languages. I think beyond uh, 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 language uh, uh, as as well. And that is the process that it, we should be we should be using as a target of additional language learning in whatever context to be bilingual, multilingual, to be flexible, to be able to uh, uh, draw on as much uh, uh, as possible from different uh, languages and different varieties of languages. I guess we haven't quite got to a point where this is going to be seen as, a, uh, as, as the objective, as also as a measure of success. Because again, you know, uh, I'm, I'm really quite, uh, 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 concerned with the way we assess people's multilingual capacity, uh, you know, even the so-called uh, um, proficiency, uh, well, well, the, the, the kind of multi-competence test is one language at a time. We never, uh, uh, set, uh, you know, try to uh, find ways of testing their ability to combine, to mix the languages. That's what multilinguals are uniquely good at, and monolinguals absolutely can't do. So, you know, we need to see, and they're not good at, multilinguals are not good at separating the languages, depending on their, their, their community. I mean, some people can't, you know, like, th this is where the whole concept of code switching, of course, originally started in the 70s, when Shannon Popla worked with the Puerto Ricans in New York City and asked them to tell a story the same story in Spanish once and in English once, and you, you, you then have all these people who can't do it because they have to switch to another language. And then the whole idea of looking at the structures, uh, the, the, the underlying grammar of code switching started because, you know, they're, they're, but it's, it's just one community. There are millions of others in different contexts who all do this. But we, we kind of think, oh, the, their ability to do to control the language and produce uh, something monolingual is, a, is, is, is a sign of proficiency, but actually it's, it isn't. You know, it's a, a, the ability to combine these and make it all grammatical. Again, the original arguments of uh, uh, Paul Blax and others, you know, the, 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 this code switched uh, utterance is all grammatical, highly, you have to be highly competent in order to manage at a higher level uh, 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 the alternation between main languages, and that we really need to uh, uh, find ways of uh, of encouraging that, and you know, build into the teaching. Yeah. Thank you so much. Okay, so now I think it's time to to finish this well, great thank talk. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> really, uh, great questions and comments. Yeah, we appreciate your precious time, Professor Wei. We wish you a great evening, a good discussion now with um, in, 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 at the other appointment. And thank you everyone for participating with this wonderful questions again. And yeah, so. Thank you. Thank you thank very you much. Bye-bye. So Bye-bye. <laughs>